So as Joy mentioned, I'm going to talk about small sample size clinical trials, uh, really talking about small trials in general, but a particular focus on phase two trial design, since that is, I'm sure, something that many of the participants in the course are struggling with at the moment. So just to give a general sense of what I will talk about, one of the things I want to stress is the importance of adequate study planning. Um, I, I, in, in particular, I think, uh, as I hope you will uh, appreciate after hearing this, a lot of uh, the study planning issues are more complicated in smaller or early phase trials than in the large confirmatory studies because you have to be much more efficient. And so I, I, I think in many ways they're more difficult because there are more unanswered questions to address. I'll talk about kind of two broad ways to address it, analytical approaches and, and designs. And so we'll kind of split the talk into two general um, general sections based on those, those two kind of large um, areas that to address with these types of studies. So I have no, no disclosures. Uh, Joy talked about the recording and how to comment. So there will be time for questions at, at the end. Just to start, um, I, I, I like to include this slide when I give presentations on this for kind of two reasons. One, I'm originally from the Appalachian region of East Tennessee, so it's a nice excuse to, to put a photo uh, in, the, uh, in the talk from that. But in, in general, I think it's also a good illustration of with clinical trials. In particular, when we think about large clinical trials or we're doing statistics for large clinical trials, we can often think about this wonderful, beautiful land of asymptopia, where as far as you look, everything looks like a normal distribution. And in, you know, in the world of statistics, that's nice because we have lots of large sample theory that if things are large enough, things look like a normal curve, and it really simplifies the process of doing things. One of the challenge in small clinical trials when the sample sizes are not as large is many of those properties no longer hold and the distributions are much more complicated to work with and the designs in general are much more complicated to work in, which gets to the point that I raised um, just a, a minute or so ago that the process of designing small clinical trials is much more complicated because of some of these issues and some of you know, standard statistical theory, not everything can be assumed to follow this, this bell-shaped curve and so much more specialized techniques and more thought and design are often needed. Now, one of the things that comes up when you hear the phrase small clinical trials is what exactly do we mean by small clinical trial? And I think it's important to keep in mind that it, the answer to what is a small clinical trial depends on the context, uh, often in the disease or where you are. So a stroke researcher may think of a small clinical trial as an early phase trial, whereas an ALS researcher may think of a confirmatory phase clinical trial as a small clinical trial. You know, so, so I think we'll address both. I'll focus on kind of small trials in general. I will spend more of the time in this discussing more of the early phase trials, which would apply as a kind of a small trial in any disease area. But I do think it's important to keep in mind that by small trials, I'm not only talking about early phase trials for rare diseases or for uh, you know, other types of situations. You may have confirmatory trials that would also uh, you know, suffer from many of these challenges with small trial uh, issues. I will focus strictly on the statistical issues. There are lots of operational issues, you know, recruitment issues, rare diseases, how do you find sufficient number of patients that are also, I think, extremely important in these settings, but I, I won't address those today. I'm going to focus mostly on the statistical issues. I do think one of the things that um, is important to keep in mind is there's no single one best approach. And the other part that comes up with small trials that I think is, is challenging because much of the training in clinical trials, if you've taken a clinical trials course, at a university, a lot of the discussion tends to focus more on the confirmatory setting and the regulatory setting as opposed to that. It's important to keep in mind, just like our, you know, our children aren't little versions of us, small studies are not little versions of large studies. And so with any small study, we're sacrificing something. And I think part of the planning uh, discussions that go into, uh, you know, that take place when designing these types of trials are coming up with some sense of what we're willing to sacrifice, right? If something has to trade off, do we want a less definitive outcome? Do we want to uh, address less precision? Do we want to relax the type one error rate that we will consider for declaring significance and moving forward? All of these are important things that have to be addressed because there are lots of competing challenges. If you look, there was, uh, this is about 10 or 15 years old now, there was a National Academy of Sciences document on small clinical trials which led to a number of key recommendations. If you um, happen to read through that, it, you can see I've summarized them here, which are define the research question, tailor the design, clarify methods when reporting trial results, perform corroborative statistical analysis, exercise caution and interpretation, and more research on alternative designs is needed. So it's interesting that comes from a small clinical trials, but really that's no different from any other trial. 
So the important point here is that just because it's a small trial doesn't mean you can relax the need to come up with a strong um, scientific research question that's adequately powered, has some sense of threshold to address a question, uh, you know, interpreting in the correct context and trying to come up with, you know, with alternative design. So all of these issues are no different in the context. The challenge is to come up with the basic requirements for any trial, what's the important research question, are you using a rigorous methodology, and does it have adequate ethical, ethical considerations to ensure that the risk to the subjects are minimized? Those are all requirements for any clinical trial, but often in the small sample, uh, small sample size trial issue, you may have to relax one or more of these. So you may have to um, consider more risk. You may have to use a slightly less rigorous methodology. You may have to relax your criteria for declaring significance. It's important to have those discussions, as I mentioned a minute ago, but there's a big difference between doing this prospectively and thinking ahead of time, what are we willing to relax? What are we willing to hold firm on versus getting to the end and trying to decide retrospectively how you want to address this? Um, I've said this in a number of uh, talks recently, and I think it's worth everyone on this call hearing that in my experience working with clinicians, clinicians are extremely good at two things. Um, they're extremely good at coming up with reasons why unexpected significant findings show significance and coming up with some type of biological explanation behind that. And they're equally good at coming up with reasons for why some non-statistically -statistic, significant finding might be incorrect because the effect is true, but there was some flaw with the design. So it's very easy to come up with retrospective um, rationale for why anything has happened. So the more you can prospectively identify your analyses and your questions of interest when working in clinical trials, the better you will be in the long run. Now, there are two general approaches, as I kind of mentioned at the beginning. One is to use analytical approaches or methodological approaches that try to enhance the efficiency of standard statistical properties. The other is to use some type of, of specific design or coming up with, with an innovative design. The first is interesting in that all we're really doing there is trying to be as efficient as we typically would in other situations, but there are many situations where we can be a little bit sloppy and get away with it in a large confirmatory setting, which may not be the case in a small setting, and I'll give some examples of that in a minute. For example, um, one of the things to do is to think about you know, analytical approaches is try to use as efficient an outcome measure as possible and to measure precisely. And so we often think of a detectable effect or the effect size, which is the ratio of the variance to the, to the sample size to detect the effect. So if we're studying something in a big setting, we can often detect whatever effect we want to by just increasing the sample size. In many small settings or rare disease settings, that's not going to be an option. We're not going to be able to increase the sample size. So the only way to really um, minimize that ratio is to come up with a way to decrease the variance. So whatever analytic approach we can do, adjusting for confounders, um, adjusting for things that are related to the outcome to reduce the residual variance would be very critical in ensuring that we have power with a limited sample size. The type of outcome measure plays into that as well. Uh, different types of outcome measures have different levels of accuracy. Uh, many times in, in clinical situations, we might have a continuous endpoint we might be tempted to dichotomize that. Often dichotomizing uh, requires greater power. You lose some efficiency than using something as a continuous measurement. So, um, you know, time to event would be somewhere in between. But in general, if you can come up with good um, uses of continuous outcomes, they tend to be the most powerful as long as you understand the assumptions underlying the distribution of that variable. If you have to come up with a binary outcome, I think it's okay to work with a binary outcome but you should kind of understand that there, you may lose some efficiency there. But these are all things that would have to be addressed, and it's important to come up with an outcome measure that at the end of the study, if you have statistical significance, you may also have clinical significance because you want to make sure that those two are kind of wet as you move forward in your design. Just some examples of, of options. So if you're doing an ALS study, you might look continuous as change in ALS FRS score. Um, other ways you could do that, you could do that as binary, a 10% decrease or not in ALS FRS score, or you could do it as a time to event, time to 10% decrease in ALS FRS score. Each of those will have different power, even under similar assumptions, because they're different characteristics of the outcome, depending upon how you're setting that up. So that's important to keep in mind. I've got another example here for pain, but you can come up with any disease area, and there are often scores that you could group in these types of settings. The other thing that's important for analytically is parametric versus non-parametric approaches. And this, so with continuous endpoints, if we 
have a parametric approach where we know the distribution. So if the endpoint follows a normal distribution or it follows an exponential or some other known distribution, if we do an analytical approach that takes that into account, we, we will generally get higher power or more efficiency in the study. The problem is if we're incorrect in our assumption, then we can be led astray. So if we assume normality with an endpoint that's highly skewed, so with highly skewed, for instance, if there are lots of values near zero and then a few really high values and we assume that it's normal, that may not be efficient because it's gonna fit an incorrect distribution. Non-parametric uh, approaches are more robust to distribu distributional assumptions, but they tend to have less power. So again, we don't have large sample theory here to account for normality like we do in many confirmatory settings. So a discussion of these distributional assumptions are gonna be really critical in small trial samples. So ways to increase power in the usual RCT, you know, we have large sample sizes, we do ITT analysis. We don't really worry about noise because randomization will take care of many things for us. I often um, use this photo to illustrate it. It's like if you're one of these kids running in the race, if one kid trips and falls down, you know, the parents may notice, but most people won't because there's a mass of kids that continue to move around. So the large sample size of runners here will kind of minimize, you know, any impact or embarrassment of, of the one person who falls down. Whereas in the small setting, sample setting, this is the equivalent to you're coming across the finish line, you're running by yourself. If you trip and fall there, everybody that's watching you is going to notice. And that's often similar to the situation we have in small populations. So it's important to use models pre-specified as much as possible. The efficiency of each observation is critically important. So data cleaning is critical to make sure that the, there's no um, you know, dirty data with your observations because one really askew observation will have a much bigger impact in a small sample setting. And it's also important to carefully evaluate alternative designs to make sure, again, that you're being as efficient as possible. One approach that can minimize this, and this comes up uh, in a number of discussions and may have come up in some of the small groups to date is the use of historical controls. Um, they're appealing from two perspectives. From patient communities, they're appealing because you can do trials without placebo, which has a whole different level of concern and discussion. Um, but also from an efficiency standpoint, you can do smaller studies. Um, the challenge with historical controls is that it depends upon having reliable and solid historical control data that will mirror the placebo group were you to enroll a placebo group in your study. And one of the challenges that we have, and one of the reasons historical controls are not used more frequently in these types of clinical trials is that that situation is, can rarely be defended. We often see placebo groups, if you do a trial with placebo, that look very different from historical controls. There's a huge literature uh, that exists that shows that people who participate in clinical trials are different from people who do not participate in clinical trials, and so there may be some inherent bias. So if you're banking on a comparison of treatment to a historical control population, and part of the effect that you might be seeing with your treatment is the same effect you would be seeing with a placebo group, it could lead to potential bias down the road. So you really have to make a strong case that you have solid evidence of historical control data and that that data should be representative of a placebo group before it would be accepted to use historical control data. In the other piece that comes up, and this is a simpler one to address, but is often kind of swept under the rug, even in large studies, is with repeated measures design. So it's not uncommon in clinical trials. We might measure an endpoint every three months or every six months, but our primary uh, outcome of interest would be to change from baseline over some period, say two years. If we're interested in change from baseline to two years, we could just compute the difference in those two scores, do an analysis, you know, adequately power that, have the sample size for that, and we might be fine. But if we can model it, taking into account all of those observations, we're going to explain much more of the variability, and we're going to end up with a much more efficient analysis at the end. So if there's a way to model it where we would account all the different observations over time, we can also model the variance covariance structure, we can explain the variability in the time, and we can come up with more efficient measurements. In many phase three clinical trials, you might have data where reliable, where feasibly you could do that, but it's not common to see that in many situations because it adds some complexity to the analysis, although not insurmountable, but it does add complexity. In a small trial setting, you may have to do that. You may have to model the data to squeeze every bit of efficiency that you can get out of your data in order to have some reasonable chance of addressing the question that you want, giving the limitations of sample size that you may be facing. This could be rare disease, or I think another common that 
is coming up in, in some, at least in, in um, small groups over the years, and probably in many small groups here, is if you're if you can only do your study at a single site, you're limited by the patient population at that site. Even if in theory, if you did multi-site, you might have a large number of patients. So again, this is something to keep in mind as you flesh out your proposals. Another design that often comes up to try to squeeze out efficiency is crossover design. Um, people generally like these when they first find out about them because they're more efficient. Everybody gets placebo, everybody gets drug. They're really randomizing the order of treatment. Um, each person serves as their own control, so it has some attractive properties there. The big issue here is that um, it, it is this carryover effect. And in order for a crossover design to be appropriate, there, it has to hold that whatever effect the intervention you get first has, it's completely washed out and disappears so that when you start the second period, you're back to where you were at baseline of the first period. And there are very, um, there are situations, but there are many treatments where that just would not hold. If there's any type of residual effect of treatment or the person is progressing at a different place and the effect of treatment might depend on when you were treated, a, care, a crossover design might be problematic because you have this carryover effect that addresses. So again, you have to reason through that that would not be appropriate and make a case that that would not be appropriate before settling on the design that uses a crossover design. What I want to shift to for the last bit, so we're talking about small trials in general, but I want to talk in particular about phase two studies. And again, here's the, the, the pictorial example I gave of confirmatory versus what I'll call learning stage designs. And I'll talk a little bit about different types of phase two studies in particular because I think that's what many of you are, are dealing with in the protocols you're working on in the class. The three basic requirements for a clinical trial are no different. Um, as I alluded to in small trials in general, and this is particularly true in phase two, to come up with an important research question may be a challenge in early phase clinical trials. Particularly, you know, we talk about um, phase two trials in general, we're trying to get more safety information and we're trying to get what we call proof of concept. Proof of concept is a different, difficult thing from a study planning perspective in that if we're powering it to show efficacy, we're really doing the confirmatory phase three trial. But if we're just getting data without a clear plan, we're not really learning any new knowledge either. And again, remember the issue that I mentioned a few minutes ago that anybody can come up with an explanation to explain anything or visually, uh, it's also you could have two people look at the same data and if one is convinced that this intervention works, they will see positive aspects from that data. And if a second individual is convinced that the treatment does not work, they could look at the same data and see equally convincing evidence that it doesn't work. So it's important to come up with how you can address an important question given the limitations of phase two studies. So um, one of the key things that I think is critical and in my experience, and I think particularly in recent years, the kiss of death with a phase two um, clinical trial grant proposal, particularly to NINDS, is something that looks like the phase three trial. It's just way smaller than the phase three trial would be. So it's in essence an underpowered phase three study. Those are, have kind of gone out of favor, mainly because there's really no question you're answering. Often all you're trying to do is get preliminary data to plan the phase three clinical trial. But because there's no question to answer, there's really no way to fail. Uh, and without a way to fail, then it's likely that you're going to go to phase three, whether the drug works, whether the drug doesn't work, and you may fail at phase three with a lot of time and expense, whereas a more rigid phase two trial design might have told you there was little chance of success in phase three. Those are costly in terms of the, res the researcher resources and time, but also, you know, if it's NIH funded from, you know, taxpayer um, opportunity cost of not exploring other areas. So there are a lot of concerns to avoid that. And the simple truth is in clinical research in general, but particularly in neurology, it's pretty much a given that more things are going to fail than succeed. I mean, the number of things that have looked promising through phase one and phase two and failed in phase three is actually pretty depressing uh, in this field. So coming up with more rigid early phase designs that A, can fail, and B, if they succeed, have at least you know, met some criteria of success that assures you there must be some at least reasonable chance of success in phase three would be extremely important to justify that added cost and complexity. Some of the common things that come up, often um, there are concerns about missing an important effect, so researchers want to put in a large number of endpoints. I think it's important to avoid that as much as possible or have good explanations. I mean, if you put, you know, five to ten endpoints in and say you're going to go forward, if any of those meet some criteria, 
it's pretty easy to show via simulation that your probability of going forward is extremely high even if the drug doesn't work. You end up with multiple comparisons, type 1 error issues that come into play, and it just might be chance finding on some endpoint, which when you get to phase 3 is not going to replicate. Um, one of the things that's getting around this, and you've probably heard a lot about rigor, as you've talked about that, or if you talk about grant applications, and having more preclinical data to support the research question is much more critical now and is getting much more focused, which also kind of avoids this because you, you should have some sense from the preclinical data of the mechanism of action, and your endpoint should have something to do with the mechanism of action, as opposed to what has been the case some in the past is there might be some clinical evidence, but it's not clear what the mechanism is. So you might look at many different clinical endpoints to try to see if you hit on the one that seems to be the correct one. Other things that come in, budgetary com constraints, you know, either, <clears throat> or either sample size limitations because of the specific disease or sample size limitations because of the budget that can be devoted for this may come into play. I think that's, you still want to have some level of a, uh, a, a defensible research question because I mentioned before, two researchers can look at data subjectively and come up with very different explanations. You'll hear, you have heard and probably will hear a lot at the uh, in-person course on equipoise, which is a criteria for clinical trials generally. If you're going to randomize to two groups, there should be some level of equipoise as, with respect to which is the best. If you're convinced that one is better for the other, you know, the argument is it's unethical to randomize someone to receive the inferior treatment. We, when we talk about equipoise, we talk about it from a societal uh, perspective. It's very rare, and I would say I've probably never seen the case, where the individual investigator doing the study would meet the criteria for equipoise. They're convinced that this new treatment works, or else they wouldn't be spending their time um, you know, researching it. But what we're really talking about is more on a large scale. Uh, the institutions, the investigators, the clinicians in general, is there some level of, of equipoise? But because the investigator doesn't have this equipoise, they're convinced it works. You know, if you're looking at data that doesn't have rigid criteria and you have this subjectiveness where you can see different patterns depending upon your prior beliefs, you're going to look at data and most likely the investigator is going to feel like it supports whatever they have until you get to the final step where you have this rigid criteria. Uh, I, there's not time to really go through an extensive discussion of the designs here. Um, there will be some discussion of these in more detail at the course. We'll give some examples at the course, but just to give you a general sense of types of phase two studies that might be utilized to try to address some of these concerns. And you can split these into two different groups uh, using different endpoints than the phase three endpoint or using the phase three endpoint, uh, but in a way that's not powered for efficacy, but meets the criteria for addressing an important question. As far as using different endpoints, um, the simplest, and this often comes into play when there's no good surrogate endpoint, there's really no data that you could use other than the outcome you plan to use for phase three, but you also have limited data to plan the phase three to avoid doing an underpowered study. If there are unanswered safety questions or there are unanswered questions of feasibility or tolerability, you might do a trial powered to um, address safety and tolerability, collecting outcome data as secondary data that can be used to plan the phase three if you meet some level of safety and tolerability. The key to designing these studies is defining what level of safety and tolerability will you achieve? And one of the comments that, um, that I'm sure people will make in the course and many of the faculty will probably call it out is to say you're doing a study, an early phase study, to show that the drug is safe. It is impossible in early phase, it's even impossible in phase three to say that a drug is safe. All that we can really do as we research any type of drug or intervention is rule out different levels of safety, right? We're, and in an early phase study, we're just looking for big safety differences. Even in phase three trials, we're looking at moderately sized safety differences. If there's some major serious consequence of using the treatment in one in a million people, you may not find that in a confirmatory phase three trial, but once it, if the drug is approved and out in the general population, it may show up. That's why we do post uh, approval monitoring. So what you would have to do is specify what level of safety are you talking about here? If there's a 10% increase in any AE or in particular types of AEs or 20% increase, how much of a risk would be too much to move forward with this? Similar with tolerability, tolerability would often be defined upon um, how many people have to complete the study on drug, right? So if, if, if you know, half the people can't stay on drug for your six month study, that's probably not gonna be feasible to study in a future trial. But coming up with what level those are is critically important. Often when I see a first draft of a protocol, it might say we're doing a safety and tolerability study, primary endpoint is safety and tolerability, but there's no definition of what those mean. So coming up with a definition 
of what those mean, making sure that the sample size is adequate to address that. If you say if it's more than a 10% effect, that would um, stop you from moving forward. Make sure that your sample size is adequate to detect a 10% increase in safety. Um, the other approach, which I think will become more attractive over time, is surrogate endpoint design. So a surrogate endpoint design, and this is attractive in the sense that it would take a larger, longer study to look for an effect on a clinical endpoint, but if you had some surrogate endpoint, some biomarker that could be measured um, you know, either clinically or in the blood or urine or spinal fluid, you could measure the biomarker and maybe you could see an effect on the biomarker in a much shorter time that would have high correlation with the clinical effects you would see over time. You could do your phase two trial with the surrogate endpoint or, or the biomarker and if you see a benefit there, that would justify moving forward to the larger confirmatory trial using the clinical endpoint. The reason we don't see these uh, as much now is, is the topic of what could be a whole different webinar or series of webinars is the lack of good biomarkers. There's a lot of research in biomarkers that's going on, but currently there aren't many disease areas that have good biomarkers that would meet the criteria to be a surrogate endpoint in this type of design. As we move further with biomarkers, as we develop and validate more biomarkers, I think this will be more of an option uh, for studies. Um, within Neuronext, which um, we serve as the DCC here at Iowa, we recently completed a phase two trial using an imaging atrophy measurement as a surrogate endpoint uh, for a clinical endpoint and multiple sclerosis. That's one example that I've been uh, involved with. I think there will be others. I think in, there aren't as many now. I suspect in a decade or so we'll see more of this type of design because we'll have better biomarkers. But really, in order to utilize this more, we need to get better and more validated biomarkers. Uh, so those kind of go hand in hand. Those are designs that use different endpoints. There are many that use the endpoint for a phase three trial but aren't structured like a phase three. They're structured in a slightly different way. Um, one that I think has received a lot of attention recently would be a predictive probability design. This uses Bayesian statistics, um, which, you know, based on priors and posteriors. And in essence, what you do here is you design a future phase three trial, right? So you specify what the phase three trial would look like, what the effect size of, size of interest might be. And as you run the phase two trial, you take the data that you have collected in the phase two trial and you say, given this information, were I to do the phase three trial of the size that I think I would need to do, what's my probability of success in that study? And with the predictive probability of design, you would define stopping roles for success and futility. If you meet the criteria for success, so for instance, if you specify, if I have greater than 90% probability of success in a future phase three trial, once you cross that threshold, you would stop the phase two, that would tell you you met your criteria for success and you would move forward into the larger phase three trial. On the other hand, you would also specify a criteria for futility. So if, it, if you reached a point where say, there is less than a 10% chance of success in a subsequent phase three trial, you might stop the phase two trial for futility and conclude that it's not worth proceeding on to a phase three because there is limited chance of success. So it's a way to basically use a trial with the same endpoint as phase three, but you have these Bayesian rules that kind of tell you when you have sufficient information or you've reached the maximum sample size for phase two, in which case you would have to look at where you fall. But the advantage of that is as opposed to a trial that only involves hypothesis testing is you actually have a useful measure at the end of what is your predictive probability of success. You know, so if that's, if your threshold was 90%, you meet some maximum sample size and it tells you you've got a 70 to 80% chance of success in phase three, you might make a different decision than if you were in the same criteria at the maximum sample size and it tells you your probability of success is only 20, 30, 40%. So it gives you some information that you can use to make a more global determination. Another example, uh, this is, I think, popular, particularly in extremely rare diseases or where you have uh, major restrictions on sample size would be the N of 1 design. And N of 1 design is similar to a crossover design, so it has the same issues with washout periods in a crossover design, except one individual gets multiple sequences over time. So this is ideal for some, like something that's acute. So for instance, if you had an asthma drug and you were treating um, asthma uh, attacks, then you, know, you might treat the first attack, second attack, and then you would randomize for a different order for the third and fourth. And you could treat over time in the individual so you get many different information on a subject serving as their own control over many different time periods. You can combine these uh, if you do them in different subjects using meta-analysis techniques. Um, and so often in N of 1, you could do separate N of 1 designs in different subjects and then combine them at the end to do that. 
it, it's a design that has come up. I'm not sure I've seen it utilized much in proposals in the course in the past, but it is another option. A design that has been used in the course in the past is a selection design. A selection design is kind of, um, it, it, it's ideal for a situation where you might have a disease that has many different treatments that you could consider. Um, there's an urgency to try to get treatments approved, so maybe there are no approved treatments, and you need a good way of screening through what are the most promising treatments. So it's selection design, it's really just a horse race. You would have many different designs, you would randomize subjects to the different, um, or sorry, different treatments. You would randomize subjects to the different treatment for some period of time, and whichever one performed the best, you would select and move forward, most likely in a later phase two design using one of the more rigid designs we've talked about, sometimes going directly into a phase three. You can also set these up where you have to be better and better by some threshold uh, to move forward, but you're all, all you're really trying to do here is ranking treatments in order of preference to try to come up with, with a structured ordering of where to go with respect to the treatments. Because of that, there's a higher type one error. That's why you would often need to do a subsequent you know, phase two in the selected design, but it's a good way in a disease where maybe you've got 10 possibilities. There's no way you could do you know, adequately powered trials in all 10, but you could use a selection design to determine which ones seem to be you know, um, moving to the top that would have the most incentive to spend resources looking at further. The last type of design I want to talk about here is a futility design. And I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about this because this is a design that many of you may encounter at the course or in your small groups. And the, the reason I want to talk about it a little bit here is it's got a horrible name that turns people off when they first hear about it. But once they understand it, it makes more sense and they're more open to it. So nobody wants to show that the drug is futile, right? The, the more appropriate name here would be a non-superiority design. The idea here is in a typical... Um, statistical hypothesis test. Our null hypothesis is that there's no difference between two treatments. Our alternative hypothesis is that there is some meaningful difference between the two treatments. If we reject the null, we conclude that we have an effect of interest, right? If we don't reject it, we can't prove the null. So you not rejecting the null tells us either that there is no benefit to drug or there is a benefit of drug, but it's smaller than what we said was the adequate effect of interest. Okay. With a futility design, we modify the null and the alternative. So our null hypothesis becomes there is an effect at least as large as our clinically meaningful effect, and the alternative is that there is not. So what we're saying here is that if we're far enough away from the null to reject the alternative, it's telling us that we're unlikely to see that clinically meaningful effect of interest. It would be futile to move to phase three. But again, not rejecting the null doesn't prove the null. So we can't claim efficacy there because we weren't powered for efficacy. That just tells us that, that there is some chance of seeing benefit. It could be that we have a true benefit that meets the clinically meaningful threshold, or it could be that we have maybe some benefit of drug, but it's smaller than the clinically meaningful threshold. That would have to be determined in the subsequent phase three trial, but it's a, it's a rigid screening approach that would allow us um, to have some rigor for making that determination. And if it becomes clear that the treatments would not meet that criteria, not spending the resources moving on to phase three. So for instance, here's an example. If, if you said a 10% increase in favorable response rates over placebo is clinically meaningful, with the futility design, our null hypothesis would be the treatment improves outcome by at least 10% compared to placebo. And the alternative would be that the treatment does not improve outcome by at least 10% compared to placebo. So if there's no effective drug or the drug is actually making in people worse, you're going to have high power to reject the null hypothesis. You would, include, you would conclude that it's futile to go to phase three and you would not move forward. If you don't reject the null hypothesis, that could mean that you have a 10% or greater effective treatment, or it could mean that you have maybe a four or 5% effective treatment, which would not meet your criteria for futility, but also would not meet your criteria for efficacy, that would be sorted out in the subsequent study. Because of the way they're structured, futility designs have high negative predictive value. So if you declare futility, there's a very high probability that treatment is likely not effective, which is a good thing to know when you have some bar that has to be met to move forward. It has low positive predictive values because lack of futility doesn't imply the treatment is, effect, is effective. That's the example I walk through. And again, it goes back to you can't prove the null hypothesis. So the futility design, it, it's an improvement over an underpowered efficacy trial because it has some level of rigor in, in place. 
uh, to determine whether that, but it's not going to give you clear evidence of efficacy. So it's not as strong as, for instance, the surrogate endpoint design or something that gives you a little stronger evidence of whether a drug or intervention works uh, at the end of the day. So I've walked you through a number of things. I've given you a lot of information, I think, in here. Uh, again, this is meant to be kind of an overview of designs. I think the the Take a home, the take home message I want you to take away from this is that any study design, any clinical trial, regardless of the size, the phase, or the complexity, needs to have an adequate, strong, supported research question of interest. It should have sufficient sample size, adequate power, and proper control of bias in order to give a meaningful interpretation of results to answer that question. And so just because you're in a small sample clinical trial or you're in an early phase clinical trial, you can't sweep those things under the rug. It's, in court, it's important to justify the sample size. It's important to justify that there is a question of interest, that you can answer that question of interest. It's important to determine that your trial can fail. If your intervention doesn't work, do you have a high probability of saying this is not a worthy intervention of moving forward? Most people don't like to think that way because, again, we're convinced that this is going to work. But it's a helpful exercise, I think, in the design phase to say, what if we don't achieve our criteria for success what would be the whole, are there concerns? Would we be convinced that the drug doesn't work? Or would we think that we missed something important in the design? If the answer is the latter, then it would be important during the design phase to try to come up, is there a way that we could adequately address that in the design so that if we come up with an answer that the treatment doesn't work, we'll be pretty convinced it doesn't work. And if it actually does work, we feel like we've set the design up in a way that it would have high probability of showing that it would work. Um, so that's the general overview. There's about 20 minutes left for questions. We can talk about any of the designs or any of the issues um, that have come up uh, in, the, in the discussion. But again, after this, just a reminder, just as with all the other webinars, to please go to the Qualtrics link that you have in the um, slides and fill out the evaluations, which will be helpful to the group. So at this, I'll turn it over to the participants and glad to take any questions. I can un unmute you all, and um, if you rather type in the chat box, that's fine too. Hello? Chris, there is a question. Oh, sorry. Was someone trying to speak? Can I ask a question? Oh, sure, yeah. Thank you. Hi, this is Vicki Levitt. I'm just wondering, thank you for your presentation, really helpful. Um, if, if one were designing a small N trial and had the option of either collecting their small sample at one center or the same size sample across two centers, would the multi-center trial look more favorable? Um, I mean, from a design perspective, that's hard to address. It would depend on a number of things. I think, um, I mean, from a feasibility perspective, there would be some advantages to that in the sense that, you know, you'd be capturing, you know, treatment heterogeneity across sites, which may or may not be a case depending upon the disease and the treatment. Um, but that may or may not be um, outweighed by more uh, operational issues of running two sites. So I think you'd have to weigh the two. Um, whether it would be viewed favorably or more favorably is hard to say. I mean, it would also depend on the budget. Um, it may increase your budget to have two sites. So I think there's advantages and disadvantages. I'm not sure I would say that one is favored, you know, always over the other. Okay, thank you. Chris, there's a couple of like a couple questions in the chat box. Can you see those? Yeah, I do. So the the first is just anecdotal, but every futility design project I've been involved with has been futile. Um, uh, and then one or three, which was uh, um, prednisone sparing with rituximab and myosin and gravis that we did in Neuronex, CoQ10 and ALS, lithium ALS. Um, I, I, I think this question is that coincidence. I'm not sure it's a coincidence so much as it kind of goes back to, I think, one of the points that I made, which is there are a lot of treatments that just don't pan out in neurology. And I think that the fact that more things have met futility and futility designs is more of a function of that. And I think 
it's not necessarily a strength of the futility design as much as it exposes a lot of the weaknesses, I think, in a lot of the designs that have been used in the past that weren't really set up to have an opportunity to fail. And I think, uh, again, if we can use more um, designs that are set up that can fail in phase two and avoid going to phase three and failing in phase three, that's better. Um, you know, ideally, we'd like to come up with treatments that, that benefit, you know, our, our patients, and I think that would be the ultimate goal. Um, but I think having a design that can clarify if it's worthy to go forward is meaningful. Um, there is a second question. With safety tolerability studies, how do you best determine what threshold of treatment discontinuation or AE rate to use? That, there's not a, I will say there's not a simple answer to that question. That depends heavily upon a number of factors that are probably specific to the study. And it would depend upon the disease, right? Is there underlying risk of AEs in the disease, or would you not expect many AEs in the disease? That's going to uh, determine that. Are there other treatments, right? If there are other treatments, you're probably going to accept less risk than if there are no treatments for this. Uh, I think one of the areas that has been extremely helpful to us in our center recently when we've struggled with this, and like where do you set those thresholds? How do you come up with, you know, a case that they're clinically meaningful? And I think this is happening more globally in other places as well, because it's becoming much more common to have representatives of patient communities or patient advocacy groups on protocol work groups or protocol development subteams, which I think can bring that perspective, right, of, you know, what's the risk-benefit ratio, not from like some clinical perspective, but from the patient perspective. And I think that can be very helpful for coming up with, you know, how much, you know, if this drug had a chance of working, how much increased risk would the patient community be willing to, you know, accept? Or, you know, what threshold would it be a problem? Same thing would kind of hold true with tolerability, although with tolerability, you know, once you get below a certain threshold, it's going to be hard to, uh, to determine. It is somewhat, it, it, this goes both ways, but with tolerability type studies, it's important to put in placebo groups sometimes just to calibrate, you know, what's dropout kind of outside of drug issues, but maybe disease issues. There might be diseases where follow-up is, is difficult. And so, you know, if, if you only have 70 percent um, who finish on placebo uh, in the study, 70 percent on drug would imply that the drugs doing the drug group is doing as well as placebo. That's a different issue to try to address than if you know the 100 percent of placebo finish, but only 70 percent of the um, treated arm finish. Other questions? Uh, there's another one just came in. Would you consider feasible to have safety and tolerability as a primary outcome and also aim for a selection of treatment option as a secondary outcome, or do you think these would be mutually exclusive? I, I think I think it depends on the situation. I, it, that's going to be – any question you ask, I'm probably going to say there's no right answer. It depends upon, like, the disease, the intervention area. But I, I think it's feasible to have safety tolerability. And, and have a selection of a treatment option as a secondary outcome. The challenge I think you would run in with that is you're going to have safety and tolerability of multiple treatments trying to do the selection, and the complexity of the study is going to dramatically increase. So if the resources are there and it's scientifically justified, I think you could do it, but I would probably um, encourage you to avoid that as much as possible because it's going to make it harder to come up with information because you're going to have to get adequate safety and tolerability for every arm you're including in the selection design, which is going to drive your sample size, your budget, your complexity of the study up. Okay. Looks like the comments have slowed down. Joy, do you have anything else coming through? I don't. Are there any other questions or comments from anyone? Okay, well, if, if there are other comments or questions um, late, later on, you can just um, email Dr. Coffey or myself, and we'll be happy to answer those. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending today, and thank you, Dr. Coffey, for your presentation and time. I appreciate it. Um, I just want to remind everyone to please evaluate the, um, the webinar. And again, the link is in the chat box at the very top. You can scroll up, or um, it's in your syllabus as well. Um, and I will post this video and slides later today. Um, and I just want to remind you that our next webinar is on biomarkers, and it's going, going to be on June 11th at noon Eastern. So I hope to have you guys attend that as well.
So thank you, everyone. Take care. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone.